Hey guys, today I have some Mopar news, but it's a bit of a twist from the normal stuff that usually focuses on Dodge and Chrysler vehicles. Today I want to look at the merger between Fiat Chrysler Automobiles and Group PSA. There was an offer on the table from PSA to FCA, and it looks like in the very late night or early morning on October 31st, FCA accepted the deal, and the two companies will merge to the benefit of both companies. So I'll go over all the details of the merger and what this means for FCA. FCA has been looking at a merger for a while to help them grow internationally and save money, and they came close to one this year with Renault, proposing a 50-50 merger. That would have created the third largest global automaker behind Volkswagen and Toyota Motor Corporation. FCA could have used Renault's strengths in Europe and their experience in electrification, while Renault could have leveraged FCA's heavy North and Latin American presence. Unfortunately, there were complications with the French government, who owns 15% of Renault, and that appears to have been what caused them to back out of the deal. So now it appears FCA has found another similar partner in PSA Group. So who is PSA Group? If you weren't familiar with them, they own the brands of Peugeot, Citroën, DS Automobiles, Opel, and Vauxhall. So they have a very heavy European presence, and none of these vehicles are sold in the US. In 2017, PSA had purchased the rather unsuccessful brands Opel and Vauxhall from GM, and they turned those brands around in just a few years. Peugeot cars were last sold in the US in 1991, but they were pulled out after miserable sales. Just 14,336 in 1986, and that fell to just 4,261 by 1990. PSA Group is led by 61-year-old Carlos Tavares, who was the chairman and chief executive officer. PSA and FCA are actually connected right now through a partnership to make vans in Italy, and that has been very successful thus far, according to FCA CEO Mike Manley, who said earlier this year, quote, it's been one of the best partnerships we've had, end quote. Chrysler Corporation also used to own 12.5% of Peugeot way back in 1986 before selling it off. Peugeot had also previously purchased the failing European operations of Chrysler Corporation as well. The French government also has a stake in PSA of 12.2% through their wealth fund BPI France, but this time they weren't getting in the way like they had been with the Renault merger. PSA can be found across 160 countries, and they have 16 production sites worldwide. Peugeot began way back in the metal industry in 1810. In 1890, they introduced their first gasoline vehicle, and in 1976, they merged with Citroën SA. PSA stands for Peugeot Society Anonymous. On screen, you can find a list of PSA sales by brand, with Peugeot, Citroën, and Opel and Vauxhall leading the way, and their top 10 markets include mostly European ones, alongside Iran, China, and Argentina. So going back to the merger, in 2018, FCA sold 4.8 million vehicles worldwide, with 2.5 million of those in North America. PSA also had good numbers, selling 3.9 million vehicles worldwide, with 80% of those coming in Europe. With both companies coming together, they create a 44 billion euro giant company, equivalent to roughly $50 billion US, and that would make them the world's fourth largest automotive company, behind Volkswagen, Toyota, and Renault-Nissan. Combined sales of 8.7 million cars per year would put this company ahead of GM, who sold 8.4 million last year. FCA released a statement on Wednesday, October 30th, saying, quote, Following recent reports on a possible business combination between Group PSA and FCA Group, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles confirms there are ongoing discussions aimed at creating one of the world's leading mobility groups. FCA has nothing further to add at this time, end quote. So that was basically a day or two before the merger was actually confirmed. And this merger also comes a few months after FCA and PSA did explore a partnership in pooling their investments to build cars in Europe. As for some more details, it looks as if this consolidated company would be incorporated in the Netherlands and have operational headquarters in the US in Auburn Hills, in Paris, France, and Turin, Italy. The board of directors would have six members from PSA and five from FCA, and the company would be led by the PSA CEO, Carlos Tavares. The board chairman would be John Elkin, who is the current chairman of FCA, while the current FCA CEO, Mike Manley, would probably become the chief operating officer, running all the North American operations from the Auburn Hills headquarters. Shares have already risen by 20% for FCA, from 11.74 euros on Tuesday, October 29th, to close to 14 euros by the end of the day on Thursday, October 31st. So what would a merger like this mean for FCA, and why did they pursue it? As with any merger, FCA can use PSA to share development, new technology, and regulatory compliance costs. But those reasons are more generic, and I have two major reasons why this can actually benefit both companies. 
So the first is new technologies. Right now, FCA is lagging behind in developing new technologies such as electrification and autonomous vehicles, both of which come at a huge cost. Jurgen Pieper, an automotive senior advisor at Bankhaus Metzler, said, quote, FCA is far behind competition in e-mobility. PSA is at least okay, end quote. And PSA does have some ride-sharing platforms such as Free to Move, which was launched last year in Washington, D.C., and they have some electric vehicles across their various brands. FCA also faces a $79 million fine for not complying with United States fuel efficiency standards, and they have agreed to pay Tesla to help them comply with European emission standards until 2022. With more pressure to increase investments in technology, this merger will give them more money to do so, and they can borrow some of PSA's resources as well. FCA can use some of Peugeot's cash and existing platforms to build some fresh cars, including electric and hybrid vehicles. FCA could also offer PSA, their Giorgio rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive architecture that they use for the Alfa Romeo Giulia sedan and Stelvio SUV. The second reason is increased presence in Europe and North America. Fiat's European market share has fallen to just 4.3%, with most of these sales in Italy. The only cars Fiat still sells in Europe are the 500 and Panda Mini cars, 500L minivan, 500X crossovers, and Tipo compact car. So FCA could definitely benefit from PSA's platforms for small and compact cars. Bernstein analyst Max Warburton said, quote, PSA's R&D resources and cutting-edge lightweight platforms could revitalize Fiat's tired product range. Subscale product lines, powertrains, and future EV investments could be combined, end quote. And this also helps Fiat's Italian operations, as the Mirafiori assembly plant in Turin has been running 50% below capacity with thousands of workers on layoffs. The Italian trade union, UILM, has said that any merger between FCA and PSA must be a merger of equals that leads to no job losses in Italy and better utilization of their Italian factories. So this merger could help FCA increase their European presence for sure. On the flip side, Peugeot wants to make a return to the U.S. since exiting the market in 1991, and their CEO, Carlos Tavera, said he is actually planning a 2026 return to both Canada and the U.S. FCA is obviously huge in North America, so PSA Group benefits there. Peugeot would have access to FCA's huge Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram dealership network and help them make their North American return. So now let's look at if this makes sense, taking both a positive and negative outlook. So from the positive standpoint, it does seem that this deal makes sense for both FCA and PSA for a variety of reasons, some of which we've already talked about. Automakers are constantly facing pressure to release newer and better vehicles, invest in new platforms, navigate through obstacles like trading wars and border tariffs, plus there is the slowing down of the automotive industry in general. Along with climate change being a major global concern, there has been a huge shift towards electrification as well as autonomous driving in our technology-driven world. The competition has been picking up too. For example, Volkswagen is going to work with Ford on electric cars and self-driving technology, while Toyota has partners like Subaru and BYD in China. Carl Brower, executive publisher at Cox Automotive, had a great point where he noted that while both FCA and PSA are impressive companies, they simply cannot rise to the top on their own. He said, quote, Neither FCA nor PSA, independently, are in a position to lead the industry in vehicle sales and product development. But as a united front, they are immediately back in the fight to compete for volume, market share, and advanced technology with today's more powerful automakers. End quote. These types of partnerships were also alluded to by former CEO Sergio Marchion before his death, where he predicted that automakers need to partner up to survive and conquer within this industry, especially as things trend towards autonomous and electric vehicles. Let's look to some other expert opinions now. Carla Bello, CEO of the Center for Automotive Research in Ann Arbor, flat out said that the merger makes a lot of sense because each company complements the other in strengths and weaknesses. She said, quote, Anytime you band together resources and enhance commonality, it makes your offerings to the consumers better. You're able to offer more in terms of products and at a better price point for the customer. Automakers today are trying to provide that future portfolio that the customer demands and a way to bundle their development resources, end quote. Akshay Anand, an executive analyst for Kelly Blue Book, also said, quote, PSA is a big global automaker with a good European foothold and technologies FCA could benefit from. FCA has a big imprint in the U.S., a market PSA is trying to get into. On the surface, it makes sense, end quote. And some analysts are predicting that this merger could give annual synergies of 3.35 billion to 7.37 billion U.S. So from this point of view, both companies have a lot to gain from the consolidation. 
I also want to play devil's advocate and look at this from the other angle. This merger feels eerily similar to the Daimler-Chrysler merger, which was also called a merger of equals, with high hopes of synergies there as well. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that merger, but that ended up being a failure. Two companies from different countries, with different languages and styles, resulted in no synergies. Chrysler had one of the fastest concept to showroom cycle times, often needing just two years, while competitors would take five, and they had the lowest development cost in the industry at 2.8%, while Ford and GM sat at 6-8%. to Unfortunately, instead of Daimler leveraging Chrysler's competitive advantage, Daimler had the mindset that it was their way or the highway. They often didn't put enough resources into Chrysler or pulled the plug early on possible successful projects, especially if they threatened Mercedes-Benz sales at all. All of those factors made that merger a failure. So we never know if history might repeat itself with this merger because it just feels very similar. Another possible issue is PSA CEO Carlos Tavares, whose strength is in restructuring and cost cutting. He would likely lead this merged company as we discussed, but cutting costs should not be the main priority for FCA products, which have always suffered from poor quality control. It remains to be seen how each company will influence each other, or if PSA's European mindset will take away from some of the American heritage of the Dodge and Chrysler vehicles. Theoretically on paper, this merger looks good for FCA, who get access to more capital, better technology, other platforms, and the door gets opened wider to the European market. PSA, meanwhile, can more easily set foot in the North American market using FCA's network. Only time will tell what happens here, but it's definitely an interesting merger, and we'll have to follow along as time passes by. That's the end of this video guys, thanks for watching and hopefully you enjoyed it. I tried to give a neutral outlook on the merger without making it too complicated, but what do you guys make of all this? Let me know in the comment section below. Make sure to like and subscribe for more Mopar content, and I'll see you in the next video.